All right, here in the last three sections of chapter nine, we are gonna talk about the, um, another political party that's going to come to rise to challenge uh, Jackson and his Democrats and how that is going to shape the political landscape uh, through the mid part of the 1800s. The Panic of 1837 really creates an opportunity for the Whigs party, uh, which had grown partly out of the political coalition of John Quincy Adams and Henry Clay and opposed J Andrew Jackson and the Democratic Party. The National Republicans, which was a loose alliance concentrated in the Northeast, had become the core of new anti-Jackson movement. But Jackson's enemies were a varied group. They included pro-slavery Southerners, angry about Jackson's behavior during the nullification crisis, as well as anti-slavery Yankees. After they failed to prevent Andrew Jackson's reelection, this fragile coalition formally organized into a new party in 1834 in order to rescue the government and public liberty. Henry Clay, who had run against Jackson for president and was now serving again as a senator from Kentucky, held private meetings to persuade anti-Jackson leaders from different backgrounds to unite. He also gave the new Whig Party its anti-monarchical um, name. At first, the Whigs focused primarily on winning seats in Congress, opposing King Andrew from outside the presidency. They remained divided by regional and ideological differences. The Democratic presidential candidate, Vice President Martin Van Buren, easily wins re-election as Jackson's successor in 1836, but the Whigs gained significant public support after the Panic of 1837 and become increasingly well organized. By late 1839, they held their first national convention in Harrisburg, Tennessee. To Henry Clay's disappointment, the convention votes to nominate not him, but General William Henry Harrison of Ohio as the Whig candidate for president in 1840. Now, for quiz purposes, you need to understand that Harrison was known primarily for defeating the Shawnee warriors led by Tecumseh before the War of 1812, and most famously at the Battle of Tippecanoe in present-day Indiana. Whig leaders really viewed him as a candidate with broad patriotic appeal. They portrayed him as the log cabin and hard cider candidate, a plain man of the country unlike the Eastern Martin Van Buren. To balance the ticket with a Southerner, the Whigs nominated a slave-owning Virginia Senator, John Tyler, for pre vice president. Tyler had been a Jackson supporter, but had broken with him over the state's rights during the nullification crisis. Although the Tippecanoe and Tyler II ticket easily won the presidential election of 1840, this choice of ticket turned out to be disastrous for the Whigs. Harrison becomes ill for unclear reasons, though tradition claims that he contracted pneumonia after delivering a nearly two-hour inaugural address without a coat or hat in the middle of winter and died just 31 days in office. Harrison thus holds the iconic honor of having the longest inaugural address and the shortest term in office of any American president. Vice President Tyler becomes president and soon adopts policies that looked far more like Andrew Jackson's than the Whigs. After Tyler twice vetoed charters for another bank of the United States, nearly his entire cabinet resigns, and the Whigs in Congress expel his accidency from the party. They kick him out. The crisis of Tyler's administration was just one sign of the Whig party's difficulty uniting around issues besides opposition to Democrats. The Whig party succeeded in electing two more presidents, but remained deeply divided. Its problems grew as the issue of slavery strained the Union in the 1850s, Unable to agree on a consistent national position on slavery, they were unable to find another national issue to rally around, and the Whigs end up breaking apart by 1856. Now, what was a part of this Whig coalition? Well, the Whig coalition really drew strengths from several different parties, including two that harnessed American political paranoia. The Anti-Masonic Party, formed in the 1820s for the purpose of destroying the Freemasons. Later, the anti-immigrant sentiment formed the American Party, also known as the Know-Nothings. The American Party sought, to, sought and won office across the country in the 1850s, but nativism had already been influential force, particularly in the Whig Party, whose members could not fail to notice that urban Irish Catholics strongly tended to support Democrats. Now, Freemasonry was an international network of social clubs with arcane traditions and rituals. They seemed to have originated in medieval Europe as a trade organization for stonemasons. But by the 18th century, it had outgrown its relationship with the Mason's craft and had become a general secular fraternal order that proclaimed adherence to the ideals of the Enlightenment. Freemasonry was an important part of social life for the men in the New Republic's elite. 
George Washington, Ben Franklin, Andrew Jackson, Henry Clay, all claim membership. Prince Hall, a leather worker in Boston, founded a separate branch of the order for African American men. However, the Masonic Brotherhood's secrecy, elitism, rituals, and secular ideas generated a very deep suspicion of the organization among many Americans. In, eight, in the 1820s, upstate New York, which was very fertile soil for new religious and social reform movements, anti-Masonic suspicion would emerge for the first time as an organized political force. The trigger for this was the strange disappearance and probable murder of William Morgan. Morgan announced plans to publish an expose called Illustrations of Masonry. The, the book purport, purported to reveal the order's secret rights and it outraged other local Freemasons. They launched a series of attempts to prevent the book from being published, including an attempt to burn the press and the conspiracy to have Morgan jailed for his alleged debts. In September, Morgan disappears. He was last seen being forced into a carriage by four men later identified as Masons. When a corpse washed up on the shore of Lake Ontario, Morgan's wife and friends claimed that it, at first it was his. The Morgan story convinced many people that masonry was a dangerous influence in the Republic. The publicity surrounding the, tr the trials transformed local outrage into a political movement that, though small, had significant power in New York and other parts of New England. This movement addressed Americans' widespread dissatisfaction about the economic and political change by giving them a handy explanation, the Republic's being controlled by secret societies. In 1827, local anti-Masonic committees began meeting across the state of New York, committing not to vote for any political candidate who belonged to the Freemasons. As this boycott grows, and in 1828, a convention in the town of Leroy produced an anti-Masonic Declaration of Independence, which was the basis for the anti-Masonic Party. In 1828, anti-Masonic politicians ran for state office in New York, winning the leaders of the anti-Masonic party folded their movement into the new Whig party. The anti-Masonic party's absorption into the Whig coalition demonstrated the importance of conspiracy theories in American politics. Just as Andrew Jackson's followers detected a vast foreign plot in the form of the Bank of the United States, some of his enemies could detect it in the form of Freemasons. Others, called nativists, blamed immigrants. Nativists detected many foreign threats, but Catholicism may have been the most important to them. Nativists watched with horror as more and more Catholic immigrants, especially from Ireland and Germany, arrived in American cities. These immigrants professed different beliefs, often spoke unfamiliar languages, and participated in alien cultural traditions. Just as importantly, nativists remembered Europe's history of warfare between Catholics and Protestants, and they feared that the Catholics would bring this religious violence with them to the United States. In the summer of 1834, a mob of Protestants attack a Catholic convent near Boston. The rioters had read newspaper rumors that a woman was being held against her will by the nuns. Angry men broke into the co convent and burned it to the ground. Later, a young woman named Rebecca Reed, who had spent time in the convent, published a memoir de describing abuses she claimed the nuns had directed toward novices and students. The convent attack was among many eruptions of nativism, especially in New England and other parts of the Northeast during this early 19th century. Many Protestants saw Catholic faith as a superstitious that deprived individuals of their rights to think for themselves and enslaved them to a dictator, the Pope, in Rome. They accused Catholic priests of controlling their parishioners and preying sexually on young women. They feared that Catholicism would overrun and conquer the American political system, just as their ancestors had feared it would conquer England. The painter and inventor Samuel F. B. Morris, for example, warned in 1834 that European tyrants were conspiring together to carry popery through all our borders by sending Catholic immigrants to the United States. If they succeeded, he predicted Catholic dominance in America would mean the certain destruction of our free institutions. Around the same time, the Protestant minister Lyman Beecher lectured in various cities, delivering a similar warning. If the potents of Europe have no desire upon our liberties, Beecher demanded, then they, then why were they sending over such floods of pauper immigrants, the confidence of the poorhouse and sweepings of the street, multiplying tumults and violence, filling our prisons and crowding our poorhouses and quadru quadrupling our taxation, not to mention the fact that these people were voting in American elections. One of the third things that really took a 
front row uh, in the minds of American voters was race. More than anything else, it was the racial inequality that exposed America's democracy's limits. Over several dec decades, state governments had lowered their property requirements so poorer white men could vote. But as northern, slaves, or northern states ended slavery, whites worried that free black men could go to the polls in large numbers. So in response, they adopted new laws that made racial discrimination the basis of American democracy. For quiz purposes, you need to remember that at the time of the revolution, only two states explicitly limited black voting rights. But by 1839, almost all states did. Now, there were four exceptions, all of them in New England, where the Democratic Party was the weakest. For example, New York's 1821 state constitution enfranchised nearly all white male taxpayers, but only the richest black men. In 1838, a similar constitution in Pennsylvania prohibited black voting completely. The new Pennsylvania constitution disenfranchised even one of the richest people in Philadelphia, James Fortin a free-born sailmaker who served in the American Revolution, had become a wealthy merchant and landowner. He used his wealth and influence to promote the abolition of slavery, and after the 1838 Constitution, he undertook a lawsuit to protect his right to vote. But he lost, and his voting rights were terminated. An English observer commented sarcastically that Fortin wasn't white enough to vote, but he's always been considered white enough to be taxed. During the 1830s, furthermore, the social tensions that had promoted Andrew Jackson's rise also worsened race relations. Almost 400,000 free blacks lived in America by the end of the decade. In the South and the West, Native Americans stood in the way of white expansion, and the new Catholic immigrants, along with Native working class whites, often despised non-whites as competitors for scarce, scarce work, housing, and status. Racial and ethnic resentment thus contributed to a wave of riots in American cities during the 1830s. In Philadelphia, thousands of white rioters torched an anti-slavery meeting house and attacked black churches and homes. Near St. Louis, abolitionist newspaper editor Elijah Lovejoy was murdered as he defended his printing press. Contemplating the violence, another journal journalist wondered, does it not appear that the character of our people has suffered a considerable change for the worse? Racial tensions also influenced popular culture. The white actor, Thomas Dartmouth Rice, appeared on stage in blackface, singing and dancing as a clownish slave named Jim Crow. Many other white entertainers, entertainers copied him, borrowing from the work of real black performers, but pandering to white audiences' prejudices. They turned to cruel stereotypes into one of these antebellum America's favorite forms of entertainment. Some whites in the 1830s, however, joined free black activists in protesting racial inequality. Usually they lived in northern cities and came from the class of skilled laborers, or in other words, the lower middle class. Most of them were not rich, but they expected to rise in the world. In Boston, for example, the female anti-slavery society included women whose husbands sold coal, mended clothes, baked bread, as well as women from wealthy families. In the nearby village of Lynn, many abolitionists were shoemakers. They organized boycotts of consumer products like sugar that had come from slave labor, and they sold their, old, their own handmade goods at anti-slavery fundraising fairs. For many of them, the anti-slavery movement was a way to participate in respectable middle-class culture, a way for both men and women to, say in a, to have a say in American life. Debates about slavery, therefore, reflected, what, reflected wider tensions in changing society, and the ultimate question was whether American democracy had room for people of different races, as well as religions and classes. Some people said yes, and struggled to make American society more welcoming. But the vast majority, whether Democrats or Whigs, said no.